Hello, welcome to a new episode of Growing Down. Uh, we have David Nickel. He is the author of Subtle Activism. Welcome, David. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Um, so reading your book, I was super excited to have this idea presented. And um, it's a pretty heady subject, and it can go, I, I think, in lots of directions in trying to prepare for this. But to start off, I was hoping if you can give the listeners uh, your definition of subtle activism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I talk about subtle activism as the use of consciousness-based practices like meditation or prayer for collective healing and transformation. And the main distinction there is that those sort of practices are traditionally focused on individual change and growth. <clears throat> and it's in a sense of a, a simple concept that we can apply those sort of practices for the collective realm of healing. Um, and I've been specifically interested in the potential of <clears throat> group practices where there's an additional power coming through a coherent group field that um, my intuition is that it has gives us access to the collective realm of consciousness and where we can engage in healing issues at that level, the social level, the collective level. So I'll just say that it's never uh, something that I present as an alternative to um, other forms of activism in the sense of um, the only thing that we should do, but rather a complementary approach where, um, uh, but potentially one that has been overlooked largely in our more materialistic sort of society, but one that could play a potentially crucial role that when you address this element of consciousness at the source, uh, uh, in conjunction with inspired creative action on the ground, that you're setting in motion a, uh, a change at a very deep level that uh, can be part of a more holistic approach to social change. Excellent. Um, one of my questions that I had sort of while reading this was imagining, or, and maybe not, but um, do, you, do you often get any pushback from the more scientific ground? I know you, you said in the book that uh, consciousness doesn't lend itself to objective analysis very well. Um, did you, wh what has your experience been like? Have you found people to be very receptive to it or is it a mixed bag where people are still kind of dismissing sort of the validity that you present in the book? Yeah, I mean, I think that it depends on who you're talking to, of course. Like there's uh, um, mostly, I haven't felt like it's been my mission to go into the realm of really hardcore skeptical materialist scientists and try and you know, enroll them in this, in this idea. Um, I'm, I'm in, in the book, I do make a case to build a bridge for people who are curious and open-minded. Um, and I set out a lot of the empirical evidence that is there about uh, non-local connections um, in consciousness. Um, <clears throat> Mostly I found that there are um, a lot of people who intuitively resonate with this idea and who feel that um, when they experience the practice, there's a certain kind of uh, um, inner knowing when you're in that space that you're contributing in a good way, that there's something that you're doing that feels healthy and, and hopeful. <clears throat> and there's, a, in my experience, there's a certain type of person who feels that gets very clearly that this is what they're called to do. This is a way that they can contribute that resonates with them. Um, and um, mostly I feel like my job is to put out this signal and people who are in resonance with this signal come <clears throat> and we create these fields together. Um, and I'm not on a mission to uh, convert the whole world or to convert the, um, the you know, the, the, the deeply uh, scientifically skeptical. 
Yeah. So, oh, go ahead, Jeremy. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, uh, this is more of kind of a demographics question of, of uh, the students that you work with and your colleagues in the field doing these practices. Um, uh, is their orientation more, how to say this, or, so I guess they're not really deeply involved in leftist activist circles, or would you say a lot of them are, right? They're kind of closet spiritualists or closet uh, mystics, right, that are, mm -hmm. that, 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 want to include this spiritual dimension to their activism or their practice, or are they, is this kind of the first introduction to activism uh, kind of coming from the more spiritual angle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we get both. I would say, I'd say our, our primary audience is, it, it comes from both uh, sectors where you have people who have done activism and they get burnt out or they get disillusioned or they feel like there's, there's something missing and there's a, there's a deeper purpose that, that brought them into activism in the first place that gets obscured when they are sort of too down in the, in the uh, you know, the grunt work. Uh, and so those sort of people usually come and they find, ah, I've, I'm reconnecting with something that feels nourishing and uplifting and, um, is still oriented towards changing the world, um, but is coming from a place that feels sustainable to them. Uh, and, and then we also get, I would say, probably a, a larger audience of people who are coming from um, like a meditation background, uh, background of a lot of people who, who just feel a certain sacred connection to the earth. Um, and this approach resonates for them. They, they, they have a spiritual practice, but they are feeling called to make more of a difference in the world, to, to lean in there, to not just have their practice be about themselves. Uh, and those people also, um, you know, tends to be our, our main audience. Uh, David, in the book, um, you talked about, in your experience, um, the most opposition to subtle activis activism um, comes from the ranks of traditional activists, particularly those on the political left. And I was wondering if you could maybe expand on that and what your, what your reasoning and why you think so. Yeah, well, there is a certain kind of intellectual um, heritage, I think, on the left from Marxism. A lot of activists have um, their view of the world. You know, there's, there's many intellectual roots in a, a more Marxist, more materialist way of understanding what's going on in the world and seeing everything in terms of power dynamics, but also um, more strictly about uh, you know, material wealth and the share of the pie and that sort of thing. And <clears throat> Um, going back to Karl Marx, he was most famous, you know, he's famous for that statement, religion is the opiate of the masses. So in built in that philosophy is a kind of skepticism towards, I think, spiritual approaches as, as being distractions or even uh, a, a, a pathway that obscures the real work that needs to be done that obscures the power dynamic is a pacifier in some way. That was kind of his approach. Uh, uh, so, you know, those kinds of people, I think their first response is, is more suspicion towards something that's not as, as um, tangible. Um, but, you know, I've, I've also had the experience uh, that, when people actually get in and do the practice together and experience the field and they're in there, then some of those concerns die away. And, and <clears throat> I think too, it really depends on um, how you approach this whole uh, arena of, of subtle activism. There, there are ways that people, uh, um, you know, in more new age circles that espouse similar concepts and it doesn't, it doesn't feel grounded. You know, it doesn't feel credible in a certain way. Um, there's a certain, I think, right attitude to how we engage this uh, that is not claiming too much, that is not ungrounded from the actual realities of suffering on the planet. And uh, it's, a, it, you know, that is embracing the complexity of things. Um, and 
when that attitude is presented in the right way, some of these more initial skeptical responses tend to settle down. And then when they have an actual experience of being in a field of hundreds of people in a very heartfelt way who are engaging with some of these issues of our times, then it, it's hard not to be touched by that. It's hard not to feel a certain kind of uh, reality and power in that and, and, and a goodness in that. Yeah, I mean, Jeremy and, uh, and I and uh, Ryan, our co-host, who couldn't be here today, started this podcast. Uh, we both kind of come from an a integral background, Jeremy more Gepsirian and, and me more Wilberian. But definitely, I think we found there is maybe a niche or a gap missing as far as to take sort of some um, of that uh, knowledge or interest and, and apply it to, to politics. So it's, it's very nice to have a book like Subtle Activism waiting for us to sort of dig into and hopefully, I think, connect a lot of the gap between what we're experiencing in current day politics and, yeah. and maybe some of the stuff that we have found in our own lives to be enriching and, like you said, uh, a source to connect with. And yeah. so I was wondering, with, with you kind of looking at today's political arena, um, how best can subtle activism play a role? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's such a crazy time. Right? Yeah. Um, one of the main challenges, of course, right now is just how polarized things are in ways that we're, we're so in our bubbles. Um, it's so difficult to have any healthy, meaningful exchange across these bubbles right now. Um, and this is where I think the, uh, an approach like subtle activism is extremely valuable because um, it's, a, it's a methodology that goes beyond debate. It goes beyond or, or even dialogue, which right now is very challenging. Um, and it's about creating spaces where we together drop into these deeper grounds, these deeper uh, dimensions of ourselves where we tend to just uh, know innately, connect innately with the deeper unity that we all share in those spaces. And it's been very often my experience with these sort of practices that people come into the practice with a certain kind of position um, about a certain political issue, for instance, and then we drop into this deeper space and some deeper wisdom emerges, a deeper seeing, a deeper kind of revelation that shifts their more superficial positionality and, they, and, and that wisdom tends to be more infused with seeing the wholeness of things and they start to see, Oh, that was a more limited, you know, partisan view that I had. There's some deeper wisdom coming through here that is healing. Um, and I mean, I'm politically these days, I'm, I'm, um, have moved to a place where I'm, I'm more hopeful that, or I'm more oriented towards, creating the ground for the emergence of something that I hope can come out of this polarization, a, a, a something new, a, a new um, you know, second tier kind of consciousness that is more um, integrative. Um, I'm hoping that that is a sort of evolutionary dynamic that's happening here that, that out of this extreme polarization, it might be creating a certain kind of, vacuum in the in the in the middle for a new kind of synthesis uh and so that's where i feel like putting my energy and that's where i feel like the practice of subtle activism can on a on a deep energetic level support that more integrative emergence which i think is so you know so needed right now you think there's um an element here, especially with having a spiritual practice uh, like the one that you developed, um, a kind of developing clarity or coherence about what is emerging or um, a better attunement to what is emerging in that sense, right? So that we as practitioners in the field can sort of sense like 
okay, not, not only is this a kind of a spiritual attitude that I, that I sense is kind of this new center, but also I can understand clearly where to act materially in terms of my activism and also the attitudes to, to embody in daily life in terms of um, uh, promoting and generating that new attitude in my own social circles, right? Or in yeah. the subtle dimension too, like you're talking about, um, the, the sort of invisible effects of having that attitude at this time in culture and in, in where we are in cultural evolution. So I don't know if that question quite makes sense, but it's sort of what I'm getting no. from what you're saying. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that engaging in this sort of practice, um, it, it helps us to sense where the evolutionary energies are going uh, and to be able to perceive that that is sort of underneath what appears on the surface the um you know there you can see these dynamics playing out in the political arena but when we uh, develop that sensing capacity on a deeper way it's like oh sort of being able to recognize that's that looks loud but it's more like noise um and w where do, where do we sense the actual current of life of the creative life force uh and how and it's and in recognizing that it becomes easier to align ourselves with that um in our own lives in a practical way to get the guidance about, okay, this, this, this path has that flavor of, oh, that, that is filled with that life force, with that creative life force. Um, um, but I'm also, you know, particularly interested in what is happening when we're doing this together as a coherent group field and so this is in a sense, the core innovation that has come through in, in my work in the last five or six years. Um, and, you know, there are many experiments of this kind of uh, phenomenon, but that, that there's something I think of value that we're doing that we might not even know fully uh, what that is yet in terms of creating these kind of uh, very, these coherent, um, portals in consciousness or these coherent nodes of consciousness where people are aligning to something more real, to something deeper. Um, and that, that as many different groups do that, that that could be part of what is helping to sort of catalyze um, where the whole field can start to, to go. That they, it's a sort of a magnetic attractor, you know, to, uh, to that kind of uh, ordering in the system. Um, I thought uh, maybe we can kind of dive into the uh, principles you presented in subtle activism and maybe some examples can be brought up to better situate our listeners to the, these ideas that, you, that you've brought up. Uh, the first uh, principle here is uh, beneath the surface appearance of separate objects, there's a universal field of consciousness that is seen as an underlying ground and creative source of everything in existence. And the, the example, um, I, I've been a TM practitioner now for over 20 years and stuff, and you've mentioned the Maharishi unified field, but I was wondering hopefully if maybe you can go in a little, a little bit more about that uh, principle. Yeah, well, I mean, this is in a sense a very basic principle of, in the sense that the whole notion of subtle activism doesn't of course make much sense if you're are coming from as a strictly materialistic understanding of reality. You know, the, the notion that when we meditate that something interesting might be happening in you know, being interconnected with each other from a straightforward materialistic perspective, that's just fantasy, right? But so it, this, this principle is, is just s stating that, um, a world view that is um, necessary in a sense to make sense of this approach includes this perspective that there is something deeper. There is a, a deeper ground there is through which we're, we're all connected. And of course, <clears throat> this has been the idea behind most of the world's wisdom traditions um, and mystical traditions. And 
um, but also an idea that's been advanced in the West in, in various uh, disciplines like Carl Jung's notion of the collective unconscious or um, um, Rupert Sheldrake's notion of morphic fields and, and, and so on. So this is, you know, kind of a basic idea that what, even though we appear to be on the surface, separate material objects, um, that there is a deeper ground that in consciousness, we are connected at a deeper level. Um, and that has gone by many names in many traditions, um, the universal field, God, you know, the void, you know, the Tao, all kinds of descriptors of that phenomenon of being interconnected on that deeper level. But it's, it's kind of a starting point, if you like, for a worldview that makes sense of something like subtle activism. Yeah, I was curious too. You, you, um, you, one of the ways I got in connect, connection with you was through Jorge Ferrer. Mm -hmm. And I know you mentioned, and I'm interested, like you said here, that following Ferrer, the creative source can be described as a mystery that is irreducible to any particular conception, yet it's capable of being experienced through human creative, co creative involvement in the form of various spiritual realizations. Uh -huh. And I'm just curious. Uh, uh, I mean, more just personally, that Ferrer seems to have brought something to this identification with uh, the perennial philosophy that's that's sort of new. And, and I was just seeing if you can maybe expand a little bit on, on the importance of his work to, to that notion of how we connect to this field. Yeah, I mean, I think that what Jorge Ferrer did, which I found to be liberating um, and important, was um, freeing up our conceptions of that deeper ground from any sort of particular fixed or dogmatic view of what that what that is. Even even a view like in the perennial philosophy, I think it intuitively rings true to many people. It's it, it has a lot of uh, resonance, uh, and yet there's a way in um, conceiving of that ground as a truly indeterminate mystery that it, um, it, it I feel it it creates a bit more freedom in that space a bit more possibility of um, um, always preserving the mystery of it and always allowing a kind of fresh engagement with it it's it's sort of uh, where we're not stuck in any kind of conceptual scheme that subtly conditions our consciousness to just be sort of reproducing something that has, has always been there. We've always read about, or we're just sort of following the same old groove. It kind of creates this possibility of, of a new or fresh engagement with it. And in terms of, of subtle activism, what I wanted to do was um, really create an open invitation for um, many different ways of engaging in this approach. Um, in, you know, it's in some ways to, to the concept of subtle activism was a, it's like a broad tent. It's an invitation to many different um, traditions or, or practitioners of different um, modalities to consider creatively how might they be able to apply their tradition or their practice to the collective realm uh, as opposed to the, the individual realm and to use Jorge's um, participatory understanding felt to me like the the most sort of inclusive or uh, free way of creating that invitation. Right so you're not bound to traditions etc. Mm. Go ahead Jeremy. I was going to ask uh, if maybe you could give us some examples of what these uh, collective practices are like, just so our, uh, our listeners can have a sense of uh, what's actually involved in, in uh, this practice. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess there's um, maybe a, a distinction here. There's, there's the general concept of subtle activism, which, as I was saying, is, is more like a framework that is inviting many different experiments many different ways of 
adapting our spiritual practices for the purpose of collective healing and transformation. Um, and then in my own work, there's been the emergence of a particular practice, a particular way that a particular form of subtle activism <clears throat> that works specifically with this coherent group field. And um, it's one of those things where it's best experienced, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll describe it, but we just with that caveat that, you know, it's one, just one of those things where when you experience it, you know it much more fully than just me talking about it. But um, briefly, what we, what, what I tend to do is it's a, um, you know, a kind of guided meditation. We start in a, in just a usual typical way of just coming to ourselves and connecting um, with our bodies and breath and um, grounding ourselves on the earth um, in the cosmos. The particular approach I have is at a certain point, we bring our shared essence into the center of the field. And um, I come from a background in a tradition called the diamond approach work where um, the training there has been to uh, identify and realize different parts of our deeper nature, our joy, our compassion, our love, our peace, and, and, to, and to come to be very specific about that. And so how we tend to work is might get people to be in touch with one of those qualities, let's say their joy, and to start to feel the joy, which is always there in our deeper nature. And, and by focusing on it, sort of, it just becomes more in the foreground. And then we bring our joy together in the center of the field. Sometimes often we'll, we'll put an image on it, like a sunbeam of light, a sunbeam of joy, but our real joy is actually meeting. And then we create something in the center, like a shared sun of our, of our shared joy. And then that becomes a very interesting, presence in the center of our field where everyone is bringing their joyful essence into the center um, and it creates this really quite remarkable coherence with ev everyone in resonance with this emergent presence that contains the shared essence of everyone in the field um, and then that becomes a kind of has its own new healing power, if you like, that we can then um, offer to uh, in, in, in creative ways. Sometimes, we, for instance, we did this um, meditation in relation to the climate change conference in Paris a few years ago. And while that was going on, we did a meditation, which we, we had hundreds of people. We did this son of joy meditation, and we had this sense that we were offering this son of joy into the conference rooms uh, and invoking that the conference leaders make decisions in alignment with what brings them authentic joy. Uh, and so this is just an example of how we work with um, in this creative way, the, the coherent group field in relation to something that's happening in the world and building these, these bridges between these worlds. Um, and kind of connecting to that, um, the second principle talks about human individual individuals are embedded in this field as well as a various kinds of social fields that correspond with different social units, family, city, nation, species, planet. Um, and I really liked, um, let's see, it's a, I think from Maharishi, um, if you don't mind, I'll just share this from your book. Yeah. Governments alone cannot create some significant peace in society, Maharishi argues, because they are simply mirrors of the collective consciousness. For him, the quality of the national consciousness will in inevitably determine the quality of the national government, not the other way around. Therefore, he concludes, the most effective way to bring about genuine peace in society is to focus on improving the coherence of the national consciousness. So kind of like how you shared with that example in earlier too, it seems like uh, you're attempting to create, you called earlier, a portal between this unified field or whatever you wish to call it, God, Tao, 
and and somehow bring it into this material element social field is that is that correct yeah um that's that's it really it's like we're trying to create portals through the coherent group consciousness that allows the mystery to come through and infuse into the broader social fields of the country and the planet. How, how large, I mean, um, you're also, are you still a part of the, the Gaia field project? My current work is more through a platform I, I call Earth Rising. So the, the Gaia Field Project was something that we launched in 2006 and it really helped support the foundation of this work and um, in many different ways, intellectually and uh, socially and uh, we did many different experiments um, and it, sort of re fulfilled its role, its purpose. And then it's, for me, it's given way to uh, this platform called Earth Rising, which is now more of an application of that foundation, um, it, you know, in, in more dynamic ways. It's sort of, the, the work is in a sense ready to flower as being from that foundation, it's now kind of coming out in uh, more dynamic ways. I know this uh, um, at the, the your last chapter is called uh, subtle activism and the planetary consciousness. And I know that's been a theme uh, for us. And uh, Jeremy, if you want to share your vision of that planetary consciousness and uh, maybe go from there. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I think this is uh, something we've been trying to define and articulate, right. In terms of what planetary consciousness is. Um, I think Tehard, offers us, Tara Deschardins offers us a very comprehensive look at the process of planetization, but it's very helpful to, to kind of circle that back into current discussions, right? Between, you know, on, on the left and in activist circles, there's a lot of talk of decolonization. And of course, oh. during the Black Lives Matter movement, we've seen a lot of this kind of anti-colonialism like prop coming up, the tearing down of statues, right? The, right. The, the, the standing up for, okay, here's the history that's been paved over. Here are the people right. who have been either genocided or colonized or enslaved. So there's this sort of counter turn to this process. Um, you know, we have many different terms for it in, in academics, but I know you talk about uh, Sean Kelly's work. Mm -hmm. and he says, you know, becoming planetary, he gets this from Ed Edgar Morin, right? This planetization process really began at the birth of modernity, just this uh -huh. process of really becoming a global society for the first time. Right. So I'm, I'm kind of curious about maybe how we can discern uh, processes, very real processes like globalization from something that I think we mean very differently with planetization, right? right. Because if we say the planetary began then, it, it kind of gets tangled in colonialism it gets uh -huh. tangled in the birth of you know modern capitalism in in, yeah. uh, in england etc so i wonder if we can kind of explore that yeah this is great i love this sort of conversation by the way awesome. um I, I i talked about this in that chapter actually in the book in in that in the sense that um the planetization process obviously is not just a linear straightforward um you know, greater and greater unity, like there's a need to go back and do the healing of those wounds and traumas for it to be real. You know, there's, there's a necessary step and you, you, you know, you could see all of what's happening, I think in that light of um, it's not necessarily um, ultimately against the movement towards the emergence of a, a, a more unified planetary culture, uh, but you could say the necessary work of going back and addressing the, the, the wounds, the traumas that have occurred in the sort of dominant march of, of Western culture, um, which is why, you know, I think right now it feels like the real priority, and I feel this in, in, in my work, is <clears throat> applying these 
collective fields for trauma healing, for intergenerational collective trauma healing to go to the source of those things. And, I mean, I think that there's one of the dynamics though that I'm seeing that I feel is potentially challenging is um, because there's the trauma there, it's like the resolution I don't think is going to happen just in the social political realm. Like the way that these movements are looking for resolution in those realms, if, if it's not accompanied by the more profound trauma healing work that's, that's at the deeper level. Um, it's not so much in the, I don't think in the, um, um, the lower right space, if you like to use, you know, the integral model, um, but perhaps more the lower left where the, the, the deep healing of those things can happen. Um, and th th that to me feels like where the, where the, the leverage is or the crucial sort of action is right now to do that piece. And then of course, it's like the, um, a more organic sort of emergence towards wholeness needs to follow something like that or can only follow something like that rather than skipping over those steps. So. Yeah. Kind of connecting, uh, in, in Wilbur's new book, uh, he talks about there, there being a need for a soul culture. And I, and, and I was wondering just maybe if you're not familiar with the term or how he uses it in that book, I really kind of connected definitely with the subtle level and kind of what you present to this. And, and so I'm, I'm interested and, and a lot of, I think what we're doing with growing down is maybe creating or at least bringing to light a new framework in which maybe this healing can take place. And so I'm curious, um, it, just what you think, um, well, what does a soul culture perhaps mean to you? Mm. Well, um, I mean, I'm interested actually now in, I haven't come across that book yet from Wilbur and I'd be interested in what he says about that. Um, but I, I guess in general, again, I would say that it very much resonates of course with the whole project of subtle activism and, and that's, something I said at the very end of the book is the, the, the deep intention behind bringing this framework forward is um, to create more of a possibility where the, the, the positive dimensions of spirituality, the more non-dogmatic uh, positive dimensions, the universal spiritual qualities that we all share in our essence, <clears throat> our deeper love, our deeper peace, our deeper joy, our deeper power, um, that these, that we can create these spaces where those qualities can start to infuse our mainstream culture more. Um, and we have been in the West, you know, living in this split for a long time in modernity where I think, um, with the separation of church and state and m many of these other developments that it had the effect of, um, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater to a certain extent in terms of relegating some of these um, noble spiritual qualities to the private realm and out of the public realm. <clears throat> and so with subtle activism, you could say is a methodology to, to bring forward a, more of a soul culture. Um, and, and not, not through fighting about it, not, e not through even through um, having intellectual arguments about it, but actually just doing it, you know, practicing it so that these qualities start to subtly permeate the collective consciousness more and, and are more accessible um, in the public space and can start to bring in some of that wisdom into, into that realm. Something I love from the book, and I was just fascinated by it, that, um, and this is just paraphrasing, but um, there's, some, there's a part in the book where it talked about with, um, when people obtain higher uh, education, um, there's less of sort of an attraction to traditional religion, but it correlates with an increase in levels of belief of psi phenomena. Uh -huh. 
And I was just wondering if maybe you could expand on that a little bit and then also talk a little bit about what psi phenomena is. Yeah. Okay. So, so, um, well, that part of the book was about where I went into more of the science uh, and looking at what evidence does exist. There was sort of my due diligence uh, chapter, you know, in looking at, okay, what, what is out there in terms of empirical research about the reality of non-local phenomena, non-local connections. And the biggest, oops, <clears throat> the biggest uh, field, sorry, <laughs> Um, the biggest. I'm sure, that, I'm sure that person was listening in on our conversation <laughs> the field, I'm sure, and had something very important to deliver. Is my wife. I'm sure she, she always calls it the most inopportune moments. But anyway. Because it was, or because opportune. It, you never know, right? Yeah. Speaking of psi phenomena, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. We're, we're very linked, you know. Um, so so Sci the, the field of psi studies is the biggest field of research in that area, which is why it's, you know, I, I needed to go and look at that um, to see what it had to say about this whole subject. Um, psi phenomenon, for those unfamiliar, of course, is it's like psychic phenomenon, telepathy, any kind of non-local connections across time and space. Um, uh, thinking of someone just before they called, having a dream about a precognitive dream that someone that you love is is in trouble or something like that. You know, these sorts of phenomenon that people have reported um, across all cultures and all periods for a long time. Um, and there is a um, huge body of scientific research. It's actually, it's, it's a big field to get your head around because it's very controversial and there's a lot that's written about it. Um, but, um, but the, you know, there's, there's enough out there that uh, informed skeptics will even acknowledge that there's um, you know, there's been, there's just a lot of evidence for, for this phenomenon. Um, I mean, it's a very detailed area. I, I, um, um, I, I don't think I want to go into the, the, the details of that, <clears throat> but um, um, just remind me what you started with. I've just. Um, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. I was I, I'm, um, talking about how there's, with higher education, um, there's oh, a reduction yeah. to be attracted to the traditional religious traditions, but an increase in levels of belief aside. And I, I thought that was just an interesting distinction because, you know, you think, okay, well, you get higher education, you're more drawn to this mental objective uh, way of knowing things. But the, the, it actually correlates with this belief of this other phenomena that exists. And I think is really best, you know, it's explained throughout your book of some great examples that ties us back to sort of this um, pre-modern or, um, you know, indigenous beliefs about, you know, energy grids and, uh -huh. and things that, you know, maybe you won't admit in a classroom. And this is just me speaking personally, but the experiences you have in this life, and it resonates with you to, to, to present a, a different way of viewing the world that we live in and definitely creates more of this magical sort of connection to, you know, maybe it is dismissed in some circles as new age beliefs, but I think if you have some experiences like these precognitive dreams and other things, it, it, it feels like a relief that you don't have to be tied to the, the, the objective scientific perspective. You have this other sort of connection to things that feel more human. Um, and, and that was kind of where I was just yeah. kind of going with it. Yeah. No, I, I remember now. The, the, the basic point of that quote was that um, it's to address the assumption that some people have who are more immersed in a scientific objective view that belief in psi is just equivalent to some sort of superstitious belief that uneducated people are more likely to have. Um, and that that finding is that that's that's actually not the case um it it, it complexifies this a bit this i also list there a number of very um high profile public intellectuals who have come forward to to say they find the side you know hypothesis uh, very convincing 
it's it's not the kind of thing that is um, just found in you know uneducated superstitious people it's people who have actually done the research and um, and on a, on a simpler level I do think that many people have had some kind of experience of this sort of thing which is meaningful to them and that's why I actually think at the end of the day uh, some the the uh, more of these qualitative studies that have accumulated huge uh, bodies of anecdotal evidence of these sorts of stories. Um, any one of those stories is not going to make the case, but when you see thousands of these stories across cultures and you see these very similar patterns, uh, then it, it's, I, I don't see how you can just throw all of that out. It's a very, um, you know, in my own case, for example, I, I say in the book, um, I had a dream uh, where my father in the dream came and he st the blood started coming out of his mouth um, and he looked very troubled. And this was about six months before he had a diagnosis of, of stage four cancer. Uh, and that for me, subjectively, that was extremely convincing, obviously. Um, and I think many people have something of that kind, um, even though we grow up, of course, in this scientific materialist culture that tends to dismiss those sorts of things. Yeah, I, I, th I think um, we, when we talk about this, I mean, this is the part I think that scares away the historical materialists, right? But on the other hand, when we flip that over, like you're saying, um, especially fields in like religious studies, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Jeffrey Kripal's work. He's been great uh -huh. at sort of popularizing the, the, the vast history of interests like Frederick Myers and uh -huh. parapsychological research at the turn of the century. And they're fantastic books where they, we, right. they did a lot of that initial research where they would right. just survey thousands of people right. um, and come up with some of these um, terminologies that we still use today, like telekinesis, uh, sci, sci itself as a word. Um, so I, yeah, I find that to be interesting. And it's also kind of pointing to, you know, which is another arc in your book, uh, this history of consciousness, right? The, that the, the actual evolution of consciousness that we hear in integral evolutionary circles are very fascinated in, which is there seems to be a process of increasing focus and consciousness on material materialism right kind of a, a more narrow secular materialism as we move into um the more latter day uh modes of thinking uh -huh. so you know I, i'm interested in this because in some ways and, and I, I engage a lot on the left uh and they tend to be secular but what yeah. comes up a lot is well if you want to let's say overcome alienation and capitalism or anomy right yeah. um so many of these traditions and folk ways of living or indigenous ways of living don't have a materialist worldview, right? Mm -hmm. And they persist. And in terms of decolonization, right, or mm -hmm. overcoming capitalism, yeah. you suffuse spirituality and meaning again in life. I mean, shouldn't this interest us, right? What are the terms that they would see would be useful rather than, you know, if it gets you through the day kind of attitude, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of interested in that intersection um, because yeah. uh, I'll pause there, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a very good point actually, specifically in relation to that critique from the left. Um, and I mean, I think others have made this point. Michael Lerner, I think made this critique well of uh, some of the downsides of leftist activism is it's, um, um, commitment still to the fundamental materialist paradigm that um, I, I think you make a good point that you could say, well, that's, that's part of the system of colonization that uh, um, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a worthy uh, inquiry about um, do you need to go deeper than that? If you are truly going to honor some of these um, cultures that um you know, were, were dominated in that way to recover some of their wisdom is, you know, how can you do that without being open to uh, this broader, deeper 
perspective. So I think that's a, that's a really good point. And I'll just add um, as a sort of footnote to that too. I mean, like, I think for sure we should keep a very rigorous, you know, training in the historical materialist perspective simply yeah. because it is very illuminating in terms of what we're up against at a, at a material level right yeah. but then i think we need like you're talking about this sort of synthesis between yeah. material transformation and also internal subjective and, and and collective spiritual transformation they kind of need to be seen not even kind of fused together abstractly, but really seen transparently, like they're holding each other, right? They're, they're co-arising yeah. like Wilbur talks about. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there, we don't want to just go in the other direction. And I think there is potentially a danger with that with, in terms of, um, you know, it's, it's a strange moment that we're in with the, breakdown of many of our traditional um, systems and ways of making sense of the world and the, the authority of, of academia, for example, or um, uh, and this more sort of free form wild west on the internet of, you know, ideas. Uh, and, you know, there could be a kind of slackening of rigor um, that um, it could allow some uh, unhelpful kind of turns there. I think if we're if we if we if we're too gullible in that sense. Uh, um, so I think the project it just has to be this integrative project. I think that is what's happening. Um, I'd like to think that we could trust that there's an evolutionary intelligence at coming through this this thing at its depth. Um, that that there can be these um, syntheses emerging in this kind of um, uh, sort of crazy milieu of of all these different ideas mixing, <clears throat> but but ultimately it's like some more complex sort of uh, mixture that's going to emerge from that. That's not dogmatically spiritual. That's not dogmatically materialistic. That uh, has this you know, the collective intelligence can start to bring that through. That's what, I, that's what I'd like to see. Um, I know um, going into this political cycle, most of the, the hosts of the show were, were Bernie supporters, but um, when we kind of talked about who is the most integral politician, I know Marianne Williamson's name came up a lot. And I was just wondering if you had any perspect uh, perspectives on who you think is the politician or or leaders out there who are best presenting some of the ideas uh, and integrating them um, uh, that, that are out there right now and connecting with your work. Yeah. Yeah. I was really impressed with Marianne Williamson's campaign. Actually. I thought she did a great job. Um, I, I was um, initially more skeptical, but I, I actually think that she was a great voice piece for many, you know, really, really um, brave, honest, uh, truth telling things, you know, so I, th I think she did a great job. Um, it's, I'm not that <laughs> when I, uh, um, it's a little bit scant. Um, um, I have been myself drawn, I, there, there are just some very new movements coming that I think are at very early stages of, of development um, that but are putting a flag in the ground for what I see emerging as, as a more integrative uh, uh, direction. <clears throat> One of them is this new political movement called One Nation um, by uh, this is um, Christopher Life is the leader of this organization. And they have a very, I think, inspiring vision of um, um, an all win politics that uh, is this fundamental shift from a more win lose political paradigm. And there's a lot of very deep thought behind and comprehensive thought behind their vision. Um, I think it's early days yet, and, but I think it's, it represents a promising direction. Um, and uh you know, I have to be honest and say that 
I've been very politically engaged my whole life. And since 2016 election, it felt to me like something fundamentally sort of went off the rails in a different direction. And um, I, f I find myself less able to be, to feel energetically committed to um, candidates that are playing out in the, in the, in the mainstream paradigm right now. There's, there's this sense that something deeper is happening here. Uh, we're not gonna find the resolution, the deep resolution there somehow it's going to have to play itself out and 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 personally i feel less engaged with that more holding space for this deeper emergence um and and i, I say that as someone who's been very engaged in political campaigns all my life it just feels different to me now uh and i'm putting more of my energy towards these new projects that are truly making a stand for a um uh, you know, a, f a fundamental shift in paradigm. I just think that we're at that point where that's what is, um, that's what's called for. Yeah, I just want to speak to that for a moment too, mm. because it's something we've, we've been talking about really since the beginning of the show. Uh, with the Bernie campaign, for instance, between last year and this year, we kind of noticed, and this is something we've seen with like Crystal Ball and uh, Sega Rangetti in their book, um, um, uh, a populist guide to 2020, um, that there's this new common ground, this new sensibility that, you know, it may be a little bit difficult to articulate coherently yet, but we at least have some of these emergent themes that it seems to be focused on. Like, um, you know, populism is thrown around a lot, but what does that actually mean? It means there, I think there's this yearning to come together. There's a yearning for, overcoming these processes that you talk about in your book in terms of neoliberalism, right? Alienation, hyperfragmentation, yeah. not having a sense of a, um, um, a, a, a kind of a media, mediary kind of middle space where people, this is just on a sociological term, but like, you know, um, mediatory institutions like labor unions or associations of people coming together to solve kind of collective problems that aren't part, that aren't really the state, they aren't really corporate, they're people organizing, uh -huh. right? Yeah. There's a desire for that. And there's, I think we've, we've, we're so far alienated from one another that there isn't really a sense of how to come at that or even how to revive it in a way that is appropriate for right now versus, you know, 35, 40 years ago when mm -hmm. those systems were being, you know, eradicated or atrophied or however we want to call it. Um, so there is this sense. And I think in this year too, as sort of like, you know, what we're sensing into the present, um, in, a, in a more subtle dimension, I think this crisis, right, has really emphasize the need for a culture of mutual aid, right? That has an attitude of mutual aid, that has an attitude of, of uh, spiritual connection with one another, even though we're being so isolated from one another, right? Yeah. So I, I can kind of, I sense that percolating in the air and I wonder if you, if, you, if you feel kind of the same potentiality at least that's emerging from this time. Definitely, I do. And the sense I have is that there are a lot more people who are looking for that connection than it seems with how the, how polarized the conversation is in terms, and, and, and that, you know, there's, I think there's these dynamics of social media that are really important here in terms of how it's shaping the conversation, how it's shaping our consciousness and, 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 and somehow driving us into these oppositional places. Whereas I think if you um, get, there's a lot more just decent, regular people who actually, you know, that, that's not their, it's not their deeper yearning. It's not really where they live. If, if you create a different space, you know, there's a more human desire to, connect um and uh, um so you know i think the technology is a huge issue <clears throat> in terms of what's happening here um what i what i would just say is that even though it's a very challenging moment and who knows what is immediately ahead here um just as as you're 
talking about this, this sense of alienation, what it's making me feel is that, you know, at, at, at least something is happening now. At least there's a possibility here. Like we've been prior to this point, we've been stuck in this very alienating system that has seemed um, impossible to dislodge. Uh, and um, so even though it's scary and there's a lot of destructiveness and oppositional energy in the air, um, there is at least a, a much more profound creative potential here than we've had any of us in our lifetimes, you know? Uh, so I think the emphasis right now, what's filling our consciousness is the um, more this, this decay destruction of the systems that we have had and the, the anxiety over that. Um, but you could see that as a prelude, of course, to a birth of, of new systems, new possibilities, which uh, it doesn't, you know, it's not, they're not here yet, but maybe they're on the way. Um, and you know, this, this, this podcast is an example. I mean, there's all kinds of things, right? There's all kinds of creative visionary things happening under the underground that haven't really, um, surfaced through punched through into the, into the collective consciousness too much, but I, you know, I'd like to think they're on the way. Definitely. I think one of the goals I know starting out this podcast from you is to connect with other people that share some of these same, maybe subtle feelings that come up that this isn't working. Something's not right. Something doesn't feel coherent. And I think your work helps uh, maybe using a Jeremy Gebser word concretize sort of the coherent narrative that, that can put us in, into touch with this field and have it still jive okay with, with you know, the, the objective analysis piece. And so one of the things I'm interested in with your project, The Earth Rising, how, how do people find you? How, how do people find this organization? And what, what, um, what uh, events do you guys have planned awesome. to, yeah. to uh, make an influence? Yeah. Well, our website is earthrising dot one, so that's where people can go to find us. And uh, we offer um, a monthly public call series called the Web of Light series, um, and it's a monthly series to anyone. It's free; anyone can join, and it's to get a taste for our work. And we're, so we're creating this multi-strand web of light around the planet as a sort of subtle aid for um, creating more holding of the collective. <clears throat> uh, we have a core group we call the Gaia Tree Circle, which is a weekly group. Uh, and people are going deep there uh, every week, we're creating, it's been going for about four years. We create this very coherent group field that has many layers built into it over time and it is both to support their personal unfolding but also to practice together to support uh the collective in, in the subtle activism way um we are offering a we, we've also been offering a we call it a heal us series sort of a double entendre heal us heal us more focused on the us national feel and actually excited because this uh, election season, we're going to be with that. That was a monthly call series, but we're, we're doing it now as an eight week concentrated program uh, that will start in October. And we're calling that um, it's a kind of a fun name, heal us, the magical battle of America. Uh, and it's a bit of a nod to a program that, uh, I, I spoke about in the book that was called the magical battle of Britain that took place in world war II. Um, and the intention of that program is we're going to be creating this deeply coherent field specifically to be um, healing the deep traumas that are there in the national field that are underlying the polarization and, and the, you know, the, the wounds and the traumas from the past um, 
but also to be creating these spaces that are holding these polarities in a deeper field. The, uh, and, um, and all the polarities, like the, um, it, it's, it's truly trying to come from the deepest level of, of unity, um, progressive and conservative, North and South, um, black and white, you know, you know, like it's, it's like creating these spaces where on a really deep level, we can hold these polarities, uh, and, and, and bring healing. Um, we'll do an event on election Eve. It's uh, we've in the, in the last three election cycles, we've done campaigns, uh, around the elections. And, you know, I think the, the, the election, it's a, it's a very interesting moment, just if you look at it in terms of field dynamics, like what, what happens to the, the, the consciousness of the country the night before the election. It's a very actually special moment. Everyone is, is aware, is, is, is sort of present in a different way. They're, they're really there. Uh, and it's a kind of portal. Um, and it's been very powerful the last few elections to do uh, big collective meditations the, the, the evening before the election, because I think that's a kind of a window. And so we'll be doing, we'll be doing one again. Um, so, so those are some ways. I mean, that just makes me think of this year's election, you know, we're less than 90 days and you have, uh, supposedly the president taking out some sorting machines with uh, the, the U.S. post office because, you know, um, with, with the COVID going on, you're, you're, you're seeing hopefully an increase in people being able to be safe when they, when they vote. Um, but there's also a fear that it could be weeks before a winner is actually announced. And, and you know, you talk about that feeling you have pre -elect on election night but can you imagine that tension just, you know, for going on for weeks of not knowing who the winner is and yeah, it's just not something to look forward to. Yeah. It's, 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 this is why I mean, like looking at things from, from a linear trajectory, it's, Ooh, it's looking pretty, pretty, pretty narrow uh, here. Um, and um where I do think that this kind of perspective uh, is helpful right now, is necessary in the sense that um, one of the things I think that's, that's happening at the moment is um, part of the shift I think that's taking place on the planet is this one where uh, different dimensions of reality are coming into the into the consciousness uh we've been in the flatland right of of materialism for centuries um but there there are holes being made in that just think of all the people um across the country who have done psychedelic journeys you know like there's actually a lot of that taking place and all of these um what what is that doing to the collective consciousness sort of like opening these to these subtler dimensions these other possibilities are sort of these and 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 a more complex consciousness uh is is coming into the field and so what that does is create these non-linear possibilities i think where the 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 more complex consciousness can actually hold these realities in a way that's different than the more flatland linear consciousness did. And so there are, there's, there's more possibility for some unexpected turns um, where these deeper dimensions make their influence known in a certain way um, that, that, you know, as I say, if we just look at the linear trajectory of things, this is what I think can be scary right now is people see these dynamics that look just like previous historical instances of say fascism or Marxism or, you know, whatever your lens is where there's this, Whoa, that, that 
reminds us that looks in its patterning looks like that's going to play out this way. And I don't want to be sort of glib about, you know, like we don't know. Um, but I do think there is a, an X factor in the field right now where because consciousness is complexifying that it may not need to follow those linear trajectories. It may appear that way, but it's more the surfacing of these old traumas that are playing out that way, but there could be a different turn. So, um, we definitely synced up, obviously, with our belief of an integral consciousness, I think, coming, perhaps emerging. And I'm not sure if you would kind of connect those two of, a, yeah. you know, the increasing complexity. But I definitely resonate with what you're saying. I think by I, I definitely having that, being able to be in, in this one field, but also connected to this source of potential. Right. Yeah, you, you, you never know. You never know what's going to happen, right? Right. Right. Which is, you know, I think, I think there's a, for many people, it's, it's thin right now, the distance between us and these um, reactive dynamics is really thin at the moment, but still there's always space for that mystery to come in and for creativity to come in and the, 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 what we can do to support that space being open to that creative intelligence can I think help with you know those those more evolutionary possibilities um, yeah well said uh, I, I just want to add an addendum to that and just in, in resonance that uh, I think the practices that we're talking about that facilitate that openness to mystery, to potentiality, to complexity, right? To really that the, the mode of thinking or being even, right? The state of being that these states cultivate in us, if we contextualize them the way that you have in terms of this is transformative, this is social, this mm -hmm. is engaging the material world. If right. we, if we, in, if we kind of wrap it in that rather than wrapping it in neoliberal self transcend, feel better about, you know, uh, right. your work day, right? right. Then, then this becomes a very powerful tool to yeah. really deeply engage in possibilities, right. Yeah. And really hold the complexity of our contemporary life, both material and also what we're saying at that more subtle level, the possible, right. It's almost yeah. like, and I think, I think, you know, the other element of this too, that, that we've been alluding to, cause you mentioned, um, uh, it's kind of the occult war that happened. Right, right. Um, I don't know if we want to go into that as a sort of fun closing discussion, <laughs> but the occult politics of the revolutionary uh, yogi Sri Aurobindo mm -hmm. and kind of linking the occult with the political, right? Because they, they are linked as we're saying, uh -huh. this is sort of a, in some sense, a universal human experience to some degree and not discluding politics, right? Not discluding important historical moments. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot in what you just said. I, I just will circle back to something you said in the, in the beginning, which is, I mean, I really appreciate the, the way you phrase that in terms of um, giving the context to this approach of bringing in more mystery or more possibility beyond the individual and more into the social. I mean, my, my intention and, and still hope with this work is that like it, to me, it feels like um, it ought to be able to be recognized that this approach can and should come closer into the, the cultural mainstream. You know, it, it's, it's like that is the whole point in a sense of, of, uh, of this project is, is not to just have these little marginal um, efforts in the realm of consciousness that are siphoned off in the private realm. It's like, it's, th this is actually very relevant to what's happening in our culture. And if, if there's, um, you know, my hope is that there's a way that that can be understood or recognized that the relevance of that to, 
and, and its potential to actually, as a, as a method to um, really helping with some of these deep dynamics that are troubling right now, these polarizing uh, positions uh, that, you know, it, it can be a, a good practice that, um, yeah, it somehow escapes this sort of, you, you know, new age, California, you know, box. Um, but th th that's my wish anyway. Um, and um, maybe I'll pause there. You, you were talking about occult politics as well, but that's... <laughs> I don't know if you wanted to jump in, Matt, but I did mention uh, just if we wanted to talk about the very interesting story of, of what Sri Aurobindo was doing yeah. uh, during World War II. Yeah. I mean, that, that was such a fascinating part of the research when I, when I did that. All those stories of historical instances of, of subtle activism. Um, yeah, so Aurobindo's case, I think, was an interesting one because he started out in life much more as a political activist um, and, and was very prominent in the Indian independence movement. And you, you probably know the story, he ended up in jail f for those efforts. And then while he was there, had a, a spiritual opening. And then for the rest of his life was much more primarily a spiritual teacher. Um, and in World War II, what happened was he just, he, he, he says that he came to this recognition that the most powerful way that he could contribute was on these subtle planes and that with his uh, yogic capacities, that, that someone with those very advanced capacities was able to sort of intervene on those levels um, and, you know, create, effect, uh, but on those very, very deep levels. So I think his story is very interesting in that it shows the conversion in the sense of someone who was a political activist to someone who came to feel that actually the most potent uh, domain of action for someone who has those powers is those subtle levels. Um, so, um, you know, just, just a very, interesting historical example. I mean, World War II itself was, was such an interesting time because I think it, uh, it seemed to be that people recognized that something was afoot in World War II, that it was not just happening on the material level. You know, people recognized darker forces coming through the, the Nazis, right? That, and, and there have been books written about this, uh, the, you know, the, the black magic that they say that some of the Nazis got involved in. But I think even, even if, w whether that's specifically true or not, people felt that there was a new dimension of, of evil energy coming through that, you know, um, and, and so the battleground was not just, you know, tanks and guns, but it was on these deeper levels. And, and I think the, um, the Magical Battle of Britain story is also so interesting. Um, Dion Fortune, esoteric teacher, um, put out this call to her network across the country uh, when Hitler invaded Poland. And then they did this weekly group practice of, um, um, tuning in to these archetypes that they felt were at the core of the English consciousness uh, that, and they saw their work as strengthening the English psyche. Um, it was kind of Jungian actually. They, they recognized that what was coming through the Nazis was more the archetypal energy of the Norse gods, this thunderous sort of gods of war and mayhem. Um, and their understanding was if England tried to meet that energy in kind, they would be overrun. They had to go back to their own sort of um, cultural heritage and connect with the myth of King Arthur and the Holy Grail and the sort of ideals of chivalry and honor that was sort of more at the core of the, the English psyche. 
and they then did this work to strengthen those those archetypal energies and they saw that they were feeding those into the the national psyche of england at the time and uh anyway i thought there's a book written about it that's really fascinating called the magical battle of britain and it's yeah yeah fascinating stuff uh yeah yeah thanks for sharing with that uh that yeah. with us towards the end here um yeah. matt did you have any wrap up questions for, for David? No, I think, I mean, that's, that's a beautiful way to end it. I think there is this sense that there is this good versus evil being fought out there. And it's nice that, you know, people that want to participate, you know, there, you make, uh, you have this great graph of spectrum of social action where you start on the, on the right here, there's uh, overt, you go from street march and then it goes subtly to more subtle to socially conscious films, to intellectual activity, to activities of spirit. So I think there's ways for, um, you know, and I, and I think not saying that, I mean, my, my case is I think the more powerful becomes the more subtle. That, that doesn't mean you dismiss it and don't take action overtly. But yeah. I think a, a real calling is, uh, is a shift that's calling people to connect more to this subtle and identify something, you know, uh, this hyper-partisanship, as we talked about polarization at the beginning, there's something deeper there. And, and hopefully as, as a culture, we can start shifting and moving more toward what we have more in common than our differences. And, and, and uh, it's very powerful stuff. And I wanted to just thank you for um, holding the space for us. And um, I'm definitely going to look into Earth Rising and see how I can participate. All right, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and engaging in this way. Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you, David. We'll have to do this again. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Jeremy. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.